Well, hi everyone. Well, another show and another thing I want to share with you from Ingrid's World. On this show, you'll learn how to take care of yourself and help others. Yep, all on one show. And that is because of my amazing guests. On this show, you'll get a chance again to talk with Dr. Lisa Lowry Lomas. She has a PhD and is a licensed clinical professional counselor. She will enjoy, you'll enjoy all the answers that she's going to help us with because she actually gets people to find the answers within themselves. And then we'll talk to Dr. Barry Beyer, founder and president of the Virginia Hospital Center Medical Brigade, now in its 18th year. He has something like 40 years of medical practices for serving two decades as the chief of family practice at the Virginia Hospital Center. He is joined by Dr. Wolfgang Rennett, professor and vice president at Georgetown University Department of Pediatrics and also medical director of pediatric inpatient services at Georgetown University Hospital. He's also the executive board member of the Virginia Hospital Center Medical Brigade. Together, they will talk about the Medical Brigade and their work in Honduras. So let's get started with Dr. Lisa Lowry Lomas. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. For Lisa, may I call you Dr. Lisa? Please do. Okay, because I just love, you know, the advice that you give us. So, you know, you are back on the show and talking about our mental health and well, I know a lot of stress, and and I don't see like it's getting any better. What's your perspective as you know a therapist? You know what we're going through. I'm seeing a lot in my office with my clients, and and as you know, my practice is very eclectic. I have adults, I have children, I have couples, and a lot of people are feeling the pressure and the stress of what's going on in the world today. Yeah, and and I I noticed that. Um, then I also um, troubled me because I'm a mother of, you know, and you t were telling me about millennials and what they're going through. What's, yeah. what's that about? You know, this generation, although they're advanced and they have technology and they're more educated than we are, and oftentimes they're criticized for wanting what they want when they want it, they are under a tremendous amount of stress and pressure. You know, the world is different than when you and I were growing right, up and right. starting our careers and, and our families. And nowadays with technology and the never ending um, loop of information and news and social media and instant gratification, it's a lot of pressure. The brain doesn't have an opportunity to rest and turn off. Oh my goodness, and to turn off. Yes. And I think that, you know, what a millennial, I mean, you know, how can I support a millennial more? Yeah, I, I, one of the things we can do is encourage. As a mother, I, I too am a mother, and yes. with colleagues and with people that we know, as the people in their lives, encouraging them to slow down, but mm -hmm. also in turning, encouraging them to turn off the screen. <gasps> turn off the screen. And be in the moment. Ah. Oh. You know, when we were growing up, you could leave the house and the telephone was at home. You might have messages when you got back, but there was not an, an expectation that you would be on all the time. And, and it, it is that expectation that is most troubling. Yeah. Because it's like, oh, you, you, I, I sent you a text. And I'm like, yeah, yeah but right. I, I want to answer it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, it's hard. Yes. But um. But yeah. Sometimes I don't want to answer. Yeah, absolutely. It right now. And that's a, a a key method or tip that you can give to yourself, or you can give to someone else. Put the phone away. How about? And there there are some restaurants now, and movie theaters, and other theaters that demand that you leave your phone at the door. We are not wow. in the moment, and the millennials as well as other generations really as a result of technology and advancement in a lot of ways um, find ourselves always thinking ahead and looking at something at, you're at dinner or with a friend right. and but you're still at work you haven't disengaged I haven't disengaged so it's an expectation from the supervisor or your management yeah. but it's also an expectation we put on ourselves and I think that is what we're putting on ourselves absolutely so, Dr. Lisa, you brought a tip bowl. I did. So tell us about the tip bowl. I did. I, I have 
Lisa-isms, as my clients oh, will I call them. It. I love uh, Little tips that I help people manage themselves, manage their stress, and have a better mental health perspective. I so love it. I just jotted a couple of Lisa. Okay, and, so let me so let me so so these are tips for handling, you know, my mental health. Handling mental health, making sure that you continue to maintain good mental health and balance in your life. Okay. So let's see what you pick. Okay, so let's see what I get. Okay. All right. Uh oh. Did you put this in for me? There's no such thing as multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> what? That is all of us. We think we're conquering the world and that we are multitasking, but we're not. The brain, we, what we're doing is rewiring our brain. The brain goes in and out of focus. So we can't do 10 things at a time, but we have 10 things, projects, items in front of us, and the brain focuses on one and then is out and focuses on another and then is out. And so it's going in and out, in and out, in and out, and that's rewiring the brain. Now, in today, research has shown, and there's common discussion and knowledge that there's an increase in ADHD, in ADD, in children and in adults. Really, it's because we're rewiring our brain. What? Right, and we're having trouble focusing and and uh, paying attention. Oh our attention. We're teaching ourselves to not be able to focus. Oh my goodness! Right. It, it so, makes. So one sense. of the ways that you can maintain good mental health and manage your stress is to stop attempting to multitask. Do one thing at a time. Do one thing at a time. One thing at a time. I really think you wrote that for me. You know, <laughs> you must have been right there on my shoulder. Here she go again. <laughs> okay. Make pleasing yourself more important than pleasing others. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so I'm that, that um, other shoulder, right? Then you're on this shoulder now. <laughs> then you're switched. <laughs> you know, unfortunately, oftentimes, we are more concerned over how someone else is going to think about us, how someone else is going to react or feel about what we say, that we are pleasing them. They're people pleasers. And pe being a people pleaser contributes to stress, anxiety and depression, which is on the rise. And anxiety and depression are two different sides of the same coin. So oftentimes, people that struggle with anxiety also struggle with depression. And the, again, I'm back to this pressure that we put on ourselves to please others. And then the resentment that often comes from the fact that we are not getting our work done, we are not happy because we're spending all of our time and energy concerned about pleasing someone else. Pleasing someone else, yes. always pleasing yes. someone else. Yep. Notorious for that. Make time for yourself. Oh, absolutely. With hmm. the advent of attempting hmm. to multitask and all that people are doing, we often put ourselves last. We're taking care of other people. We're taking care of husbands and careers and children and aging parents and organizations and all of these other things in I our didn't careers. Say you had a bio. <laughs> <laughs> and then, really, what happens what? is that we're last. But we have to take care of ourselves first. Make time for yourself if it's five minutes a day. If it's get up 15 minutes and meditate or read a book that you love or look out the window because it's spring and you love to see the flowers bloom. You'd be amazed at what five minutes will do consistently. Five minutes once be a year consistent. is not going to be consistent. But be consistent. Take yourself on a lunch date. Go for a walk. But you know what? And I would feel guilty. Oh, there's another That's, one. That should have been in the guilt, uh, in the bowl, too. Uh -oh. That's something that people Make struggle a lot with, is guilt. Guilt about what? Because you're loving yourself? Because you're yeah. caring for yourself? Where's the guilt in that? You're right. You're right. You know, I, I didn't put this in there, but oftentimes wow. people think it's selfish. And selfish has a bad rap. Selfish really is literally putting self first. Put self first. If you don't put yourself first, who will? Yeah, and you know what? And I, I've gotten to a point now that, you know, when you mentioned about taking care of a parent, and I'm like, okay, wait a minute. You know, I just actually had to say, okay, time out. I can't do this. You know, right. I can't do all yeah. of this and do that. That's right. So we're just going to pick one, and right. I'm just going to do one. <laughs> right. And so here's another tip yeah. ask for help. People want to help I love you. That. I love Ask that. Ask for help. And often we don't. Our egos and pride 
get in the way. Pride. I should be able to do this. Yes, absolutely. Ooh, and there's another one. Should. I, that should word. Should have been. <laughs> yeah, the should. Yeah, that's yeah, that's a dangerous should. word. Should is gonna kill me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, strive to keep balance in your life. Tell me about yeah. that. And that's um that goes hand in hand with some of the other tips that I've had. You cannot be a workaholic and expect to have good mental health. You can't be a couch potato and expect to have good mental health. It's all about balance. Work is important, of course. My career is important to me, but so is my family. Mm. And so are my friends. Mm. And so it, we have a tendency to fixate on something and forget about other things and other people sometimes. And so really striving and really attempting to have balance is critical. Have balance. Or try to. Try to, yeah. And I, I, I love it, what yeah. you're saying. I love it. Mm. Okay. Ooh, turn off the screen. <laughs> yes. Ah. Yeah. We are so passively engaged because we have screens all the time, whether it's the television or the computer yeah. or the iPad or the phone. I mean, we don't get away from it. It's constant stimulation. Turn off the screen. You have to rest your brain. Turn it off. Wow. Yeah. Give yourself a break. Oh my goodness. Even if you, an hour a day, even if you say between six and seven when I'm eating dinner, there's no screen of any kind. No it's, screen of any kind. Of any kind. Of any mm -hmm. kind. For our children too, it's really important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, you're right. Because when I was writing, I'm like, I said, I just, you know, I, I, I said, I cannot have the television on. And, you know, I, I'll work out and then I come back and I have to write. But I'm like, this is, this is, yeah. Yes. So turn off the turn screen. Turn it off. All the way off. Not down, not muted. Off. Oh, how you know me. <laughs> you know me so well. You know me so well. <laughs> Sometimes I'm like, well, the only way I really can go to sleep is unless I have my top of my on. <laughs> <laughs> so then that's the hour that you have it on and then you have it off oh. other times of the day. And, and oftentimes people do that. Set a timer. You're not getting good rest. I have a lot of clients that have trouble with sleeping. If you go to sleep with the TV on, set a timer on your TV so that it turns off after you've fallen asleep. Because the constant screen, the light, it's disturbing and interrupting our um, sleep patterns. Wow. Who knew? Okay, our last tip, we have, uh, which is a great one uh, to end with, say no. Say no. Again, Tell that goes hand that. in hand with some of the other tips. The people pleasing. You'd be amazed at how freeing it is to simply say no sometimes. It's uncomfortable. It's hard for people to do. And if you can't say the word no, say, I'm sorry. I, unfortunately, I can't. I'll try. I don't think I can. Sometimes the word no itself is uncomfortable for people. It is. But you need to practice that little two-letter word, it. no. No. It will free you. It allows you to set boundaries. It will allow you to put yourself first. It will allow you to take care of yourself. It will allow you to have balance. I mean, that is a critical piece of many of the tips that we've discussed today and that we haven't had a chance to discuss, but maybe you'll bring me back. I think you had to come back. You, <laughs> definitely, that's a, give, that's a given. So we'll do that. I'll give you the date. <laughs> we'll be back. Yes, we'll have you back on yeah. another so show. So learn to say no. And if, if any of the viewers practice saying no twice in the week and imagine how much better they'll feel emotionally. Just say no twice. Just twice in the week. Okay. All right. Okay. I can do that. Okay. okay. I'm going to strive to do it. Okay. I'm going to strive <laughs> to do it because I don't want you to be checking in with me. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to call you. I know. I know that. I know that. So I'm going to try. <laughs> Dr. So, Lisa, you're wonderful. Oh, thank, thank you, you so, so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Coming up next, we'll be talking to, about the wonderful, with the wonderful doctors from Virginia Medical Brigade. So stay right there. We'll be right back. Well, welcome to the show, Dr. Byer. Glad Dr. Reddit. Thank, Thank you. Great to have you. Uh, I got excited about the Virginia Medical Brigade. So let's start with that, you know, about what it's about and what you're doing. Well, it's about 
taking care of people that don't have access to medical care. Uh, Honduras, we go to Honduras, mm -hmm. and uh, the country is one of the poorest in the Western Hemisphere. And we go there and help women, children, men with all sorts of medical conditions that uh, have not been handled, have not been managed. So I saw a picture of the home of where, you know, a person that lives in the village that you help. Tell us about that. Well, the area, the area we focus our work on is in the, in the mountains around Comayagua. Comayagua was the old traditional capital of the country. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's surrounded by very high mountains up to 7,000 feet uh, of elevation. There are very poor campesinos living up there who live essentially on coffee farming. They live in, in very poor houses. I'm sure you will be able to show a picture to your, mm -hmm. to your viewers. Um, uh, tin houses, uh, very, very primitive wooden frames, uh, tin roofs and mud walls. Uh, in the winter it can get quite cold. You have about, uh, most of these houses have two rooms. They have an open fireplace uh, over which they cook their food. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in the average of about eight or nine people live in each house. So, so there's quite uh, crowded family uh, uh, circumstances. There's a lot of indoor pollution from the way people cook. And that is actually one of the areas we work at. Yeah, so the way people cook, because we do have a picture that we're showing. Uh, mm -hmm. they, yep. you, you took the photographs. Yes, right? I, I took those pictures. And, and it was part of a research program that we, that we did. Our organization works very closely with with uh, Georgetown University and Pittsburgh University. And we, and we did a research program where we looked at how the levels of indoor pollution affect the health of women and children. Yes. Women and children in particular, because women prepare the food and the children spend more time in the homes. Of course. So they are much more exposed to indoor pollution. And we checked the, the lung function of these people. And then we were able to use a local technology to build different stoves in their homes. Oh. Stoves that would, that would burn the wood much more completely and as a result produce much less smoke mm. and therefore much less pollution. And then we went back, so we built these stoves in these homes, went back eight months later and identified the very same women and the very same children okay. and repeated the study. All right. And found out that, that uh, not really to our surprise, that their lung functions had become much better. Oh my goodness, it made that much of a difference. It made a huge difference. And in fact, their lung functions were comparable, if not better, to Americans who live in, in our environment of the, same, of the same size and age. Oh my goodness. And it's nice actually, uh, one thing that I think distinguishes our organization a little bit from many others mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is that we work with data. We, we, we look mm -hmm. at not just what we do, but we also look at how does it impact the communities in which we work. Ah, so that's really, I think that's so important. Mm -hmm. Well, I think just as we've made, I think, a huge difference with the implementation of smokeless stoves in these communities, mm -hmm. we've also, uh, in our initial experience there, we saw people were drinking water out of the streams, polluted water, that there was a huge problem with gastrointestinal issues, infant mortality from the polluted water. We have installed uh, water projects, potable water projects mm. in 13 mountain communities. Wow. And this has made an enormous difference. Dr. Rennert is a researcher at Georgetown and I know he did uh, research and as we've worked with the uh, uh, public health department there in Honduras mm -hmm. and the results are quite staggering that the incidence of diarrhea and infant mortality have gone down, not surprisingly, in these communities where we have provided this clean water. Wow. Now, I also noticed that you train people. So mm -hmm. it's not just, you know, the expression, you know, giving people fish, but teaching people yes. how to fish. Yes. Tell us how that model well, works. Well, um, maybe we, we, we should talk a little bit about the history of, of our organization to yes. explain that. Yes. We started in 1999 after Hurricane Mitch devastated most of Central America. And we started, like many organizations at the time who went to Honduras to help, we started as an organization that provides clinical services. 
And we still do that today. We still provide surgical services, services that are not available in country. Mm -hmm. But we no longer provide primary care services. And the reason is that we've shifted our model away from the care model and towards the sustainability model. Mm -hmm. oh. And what that, what that means is we do not want to, to put Band-Aids on problems. We want to empower local communities to, to help themselves. And one such area is the training of village health workers. So instead of us providing clinical services, we train local people to provide those services themselves. Wow. And we picked initially one community with two health workers. And we, we provided a, a, a curriculum for them. We had very, very few conditions, if you want. The one was, the first was that the communities in which we would work would take ownership of the project. They would oh. form a health committee, they would form a community water board, they would form local leadership essentially. They would then appoint community mm. members whom we would train as health workers. We then designed a curriculum that is very simple and sort of algorithm based to teach mm -hmm. the basics if you want. Mm -hmm. and, and, and these health workers then provide clinical services to the community, we go there every four months or three times a year. We go and look mm -hmm. over their shoulders and we see how they, how they operate. Do they make mistakes? What mistakes do they do? And of course they make mistakes. Right. And then we, we, we readjust the curriculum to address those mistakes. Excellent. And then we work with, uh, with the public health authorities in, in Comayagua and we have to say, we have to say a, a, a great support comes from the local government in the oh, region. Excellent. And, and anybody who would want to engage in work like this, we would recommend to collaborate with local authorities, mm -hmm. local, local stakeholders, be them private, be them public, um, um, it, will, it will make a, a huge difference. Yeah, I'd have to reinforce that concept. We certainly have learned you can't just go to a third world country and mm -hmm make a big difference without a collaborative effort taking mm. place. So the partners we have include the central government, the local mayor and service clubs, as Dr. Rennert mentioned. We work with the Rotary Club, the Lions Club, the local oh, university. Yes. So it's, it's really worked out. Uh, we've learned a lot because we've been doing this now for 18, you know, for many, many That's years, almost time. two decades. Oh my gosh, yeah. Oh my goodness. Um, so, that means to say that you're really making a big difference in the lives of these communities. Um, what was it, you know, I found it interesting, but tell our viewers why, about the stoves again, about why are they burning wood as opposed to bringing in something else, you know, well, solar 80, technology. 80% of the world's poor use, use uh, wood or dung or coal uh, uh, for energy and it's a very inefficient way there's obviously there's no electricity in those co in these communities um, so it's 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 the only resource available to them I say that with a little hesitation because we are about to introduce one new resource which is uh, solar power mm. to to one of our clinics but it's still not yet usable at every house it would be quite okay. costly to introduce a solar system to every house um, so wood burning is the prevalent, the prevalent source of energy in, in those communities and has been for a long time. And at this stage, I don't think can be replaced by much else, at least as long as there's no electricity. Now, the, right, the, the right. technology that we've introduced into those communities is to still use wood burning stoves, but it, because these stoves burn the wood so much more uh, uh, so, so much better if you want. It burns 60% of the wood as opposed to 20%. Mm. In the, with, with regular uh, open fires, you burn about 20% of the wood, the rest goes up in smoke, mm -hmm. literally. Mm -hmm. well, if you, well, if you burn 60 or even more percent of the wood, you generate more heat, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. use less wood, mm -hmm. and you have less smoke. Uh, in fact, the stoves we have introduced in these communities have reduce the amount of wood used for cooking by half. Oh my by gosh, half. by half. 
So as physicians, mm -hmm. what has been your, when you, <clears throat> Coglia, what has it been something that just makes your heart just sing, the fact that you're able to accomplish? Well, every time I see a mother whose child just had surgery for crossed eyes, or a person that has, a woman that has a prolapsed uterus and can't walk because her uterus has dropped out of her body and our surgeons correct that, and then their life, life, lives are changed, or a man who had, has had a urinary catheter for two, three, ten years because of a large prostate gland causing complete urinary tract obstruction. I see these people, the mothers, the fathers, the actual patients, happy. I get It's just life-changing for life -changing. me, too. We, we, it's a very enriching and rewarding experience. It was, it's what draws me back year after year. Our team now makes eight to ten trips a year. We have wow. uh, a body of volunteers. They're amazing people that are highly dedicated to this. As a matter of fact, every year of those 10 trips, one's very large where we have 75 or 80 people going down. So we have a large surgery team, a recycled eyeglass team providing eyeglasses that were not available to these people. They're very from very poor communities, physical therapy, and we do public health education. So we have a lot going on. A lot going on. And uh, it's a great joy to be part of this. So our viewers are out there and how can they get involved? I'll say, you know, I would like to, I'm, no, I'm not a physician, but how can I get involved? Well, we would love to recruit more healthcare professionals that could go to Honduras with us. Uh, we also know that, or it's, it's clear that it's the financial donations, the mm -hmm. small financial mm -hmm. donations mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. make a huge difference because they are, they're what enable us to buy the things that are not available for free. We get lots for free lots of in-kind donations from pharmaceutical companies, from yeah, medical suppliers, yeah. uh, doctor's offices, hospitals. Wow. But there are many things we have to buy in order to do the surgery and do the other things that we do that enrich people's and lives. And it takes, it takes very little. It takes really very little for your, for your viewers to understand how far $20 can go. $20. For $20, you can keep a school a whole school of children free from parasites for six months. Wow. It's all it takes is $20. For $100, we could train one new village health worker who would then in turn look after two, 300 people throughout the year. Wow. For $500, you can, you can provide an old man who needs a catheter with the, the surgery yes. that makes him whole again. Wow. So we are, our, our organization is relying on, on many, many, many small contributions. Right. We also get grants. We write grants. We got grants from uh, Ronald McDonald Foundation. We got grants from, uh, from Georgetown University. We got mm -hmm. grants. We are currently looking at a Rotary grant. So we, are, we have partners, philanthropic partners who work with mm -hmm, us. Mm -hmm. But our real support comes from the community. Our real support comes from, mm -hmm. from uh, citizens like your viewers. Absolutely. Well, I have to thank you both for being mm -hmm. on the show and inspiring us. Um, certainly, you've inspired me to get involved. And um, you know, it just really, when I saw the presentation at the Rotary Club, I'm like, OK. This, this has to be on television, and we have to get this out uh, to our community to let them know. So mm -hmm. thank you for coming to Fairfax Public Access. Thank you for having us. And thank telling you for us, having us about the great work that you're doing in thank Honduras. You thank you. Thanks again. I'd like to thank our exceptional guests to help us take care of ourselves and help others. Our quote this time is from Winston Churchill. We can make a living by what we get, but we can make a life by what we give. Thank you for watching Ingrid's World, and don't forget to friend us on Facebook and follow Ingrid's World, VA, on Twitter and Instagram. And if you miss an episode, watch Ingrid's World on YouTube. Thanks for watching.